Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Mr. Bryant. I'm going to be your U.S. history teacher for the next year. This is a really strange year. We're starting off with four weeks of e-learning, uh, but the hope is, you know, sometime in September we're going to be back in person and uh, we'll be able to sort of hit the ground running. I want to be able to, to do our e-learning in a very similar way to the way that I conduct classes. So uh, normally on a week to week basis, we would have, we would begin the week off with uh, like a lecture, taking some notes um, and then do, and then, you know, use that information throughout the week that we get from that lecture. So that's what I'm going to start off with today is uh, a, uh, a lecture uh, based on sort of where we are starting off. Uh, I know it's been a long time since you guys have had a U.S. history class, probably going back to your eighth grade year back in middle school. So where you left off in that class, uh, which is somewhere around the Civil War, that's where we're picking up. Okay, uh, so that's where we're going to start today. Now, if everything goes well, you guys are watching this on Monday, August 24th. I've actually recorded this a uh, couple of weeks before that. So hopefully nothing has changed, nothing major has changed by then. But the idea here is you're gonna be uh, jotting down some main ideas. So if you've got a piece of paper with you or a, a notebook, something that you can just, like, you don't have to write down everything that's gonna be in today's lecture, but you might wanna write down some main ideas, some vocabulary, that kind of thing. That's gonna help you then participate in the class discussion which uh, should be available for you on Canvas. Let me go ahead and show that. I can share my screen. So what you'll do is you'll come to this discussion page on the Civil War. And the idea here is you're going to contribute in some way, either by making a comment, responding to someone else's comment, um, and also trying to answer the sort of question was, was the Civil War inevitable or not? Could it have been avoided? So after we go through the sort of sequence of events we're going to learn about today, you're going to have to make this decision for yourself. Is, is, could something have been done to prevent the war? Or was it something that was inevitable and necessary maybe for the country to go through? Um, so I'm gonna to try to keep this short. I'm gonna to to keep it about 25, 30 minutes or so. Hopefully that's not too, too long. So let's go ahead and get started with our PowerPoint. And uh, this file will be available for you on Canvas. So you can you know, go back and, and walk through it at your leisure. I'm gonna kind of talk through it real quickly. Um, but like I said, you know, you got questions, things that need clarification, uh, things that you're surprised about or just wanna comment about in general. You can also put that at the discussion group and that'll count towards your participation. That is a greater assignment, by the way, participation in that discussion group. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with what caused the Civil War. The Union is in peril, right? The United States, the Union of the States is in danger. Um, so this is, this is kind of where we're starting off with. This is the way the country looks in the middle of the 19th century, 1920 or so. And uh, of course, one of the, the biggest issues of the day was slavery, right? The Southern states were still using slave labor. Um, and you know, there's never been anything like the American system of slavery. Certainly the slavery has existed in other parts of the world. It still exists today, but there's been nothing ever like it. The, the way that you are a slave or born into slavery in the American system, where children are born into that system and they are slaves that there is no way that you can become free. Um, the, the, the violence and control that it, it perpetuated, there's never been a system of slavery like that in, in the history of the world, okay? And there were a lot of people, mostly Northerners, who viewed slavery as an evil, who wanted to get rid of it. The South, of course, who was benefiting tremendously from that free labor, wanted to keep it. They felt like it was their way of life. So that's the main issue here in 1821 when Missouri, as a state is admitted to the Union. Okay. Missouri came in as a slave state. Uh, they also admitted Maine at the same time, used to be part of Massachusetts at the same, uh, uh, to keep the balance of slave and free states equal. I think, there were, I think there were 10 and 10, right? They also decided that moving forward, they drew a line here uh, through the Arkansas territory that moving forward, uh, new states that get added that are below that line are gonna be a slave state. New states that are added above that line 
are going to be free states. They call this the Missouri Compromise. Missouri, of course, was a slave state, even though it was north of that. That was part of the compromise. Okay. But you can see here, most of the map is still blank. Right? All, the, all this Western stuff out here has not been settled. Once they decided this Missouri Compromise as a country, especially the government, the Congress and the president, they're like, all right, we're not going to talk about slavery now for a while. Like, we don't want to talk about it because it's too controversial. It's too divisive. So let's just not talk about it at all, which is a great way to deal with your problems, by the way. If you have a problem, just ignore it until it goes away. Everyone knows that works. Moving forward, though, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, gold is discovered in California. And tens of thousands of Americans suddenly want to, kind of going to want to move to California to try to strike it rich. This is in 1848, 1849. Those of you who are football fans know the San Francisco 49ers, right? That's where they get their name from. The settlers that moved to California to, to mine for gold. And because of all those people moving out west, California suddenly has this huge population and they then apply for statehood. And this question of what are we gonna do with California? Is it gonna be a slave or a free state? Well, if they had just extended that line, 3630, and extended it, it would have cut California in half, so they didn't want to do that. So here's, the, here's what they came up with, called the Compromise of 1850. And the idea here is to give something to both the North and the South. Give something to the slave states, give something to the free states. So Compromise of 1850. California admitted as a free state. Okay. Some other things here as well, but the main thing, so California as a free state. So pro uh, anti-slavery people, they're super excited about that. Like, yeah, we get another free state. What does the South get? What do these slave states get? They get a law called the Fugitive Slave Law. Right? What this allows them to do is it increases their power to uh, capture escaped slaves. So I'm sure you guys have all heard of like the Underground Railroad, for example, with Harriet Tubman, where she was helping slaves escape to the North, escape to freedom. Well, this law now allows those Southern slave owners to send like mercenaries or bounty hunters to find those escaped slaves to bring them back to the South. And in many cases, what would happen is those, those bounty hunters would, would go up North. They wouldn't be able to find the exact slave they were looking for. So they would just abduct random black people off of the street, bring them before a judge and be like, this is a, this, this, uh, a judge, this is a slave. And the judge is like, whatever, I don't care, ah, he's a slave. And so you have innocent people. Well, all black people were innocent at this point, to point out, but people who were not slaves at all, just being taken and brought into slavery in the South. Okay. There was a movie about this a little while ago called 12 Years a Slave. Some of you may have seen it. It's a very violent movie, but it's very good. Um, and this, of course, raises the question, and this is something you can talk about in the discussion group. Must states enforce federal laws they disagree with? Because, of course, those northern states, they hated this law because it made them sort of complicit almost in allowing uh, slaves to be recaptured or for black people generally to be taken into slavery. Moving on though, we have Harriet Beecher Stowe. She is a woman who wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a, is a very famous book in US history. It's a, it's, a, it's a work of fiction, it's not a true story, but it's a very anti-slavery book, okay? The book is about a, a family of slaves and they have Horrible things happened to them. Long story short, everyone dies. Spoiler alert. Sorry, you haven't read it. It's like 150 years old, so you got to get on that. But anyway, uh, the book was a bestseller in the North. People viewed this book as an example of all the evils, all the things wrong with slavery. The book was banned from the South. It was banned from sale. So what we see here are all with these events are, is the North and the South reacting to things very differently? and the sort of division growing and growing and growing. Give me like an hour to get it to do that. Um, now we have had the fortune, a lot of times in US history, we have the fortune of like finding the right person at the right time. Um, that's not what happens leading up to the Civil War. You would hope that there would be some like great president who would step up to unite the country. Unfortunately, the presidents of the 1850s, the decade leading up to the Civil War, they're all just bad. And they've kind of been bad for a while. We haven't had a lot of good presidents in the 19th century. 
um, Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor, um, president for like one year, the dude ends up getting food poisoning from eating cherries on July 4th, 1850 and dies. Just dies from eating cherries. He's replaced by nobody's favorite president, Millard Fillmore. Millard, that's right, President Millard Fillmore. Okay. Uh, if you don't know who those guys are, don't worry. No one does, and you're not going to really need to know their names. But what's important here is to recognize that that we needed a, a, a person to step up and the country. The presidents of this decade were just, they were just not those kind of people. Skipping over this. Um, in 1852, we elect a guy that everyone kind of thought would be that guy. His name was Franklin Pierce. He was young. He was handsome. He was charismatic. Uh, as you can see, the election was determined by who could get their hand deepest into their shirt pocket. So, of course, Franklin Pierce won. Um, but look, we see, you know, he, he won most of the country, both the North and the South voted for him. Unfortunately, uh, shortly after his election, he was in a train accident. Franklin Pierce was like the train he was riding on derailed. He and his wife were fine. His young uh, son was killed in this train accident. Franklin Pierce ends up, you know, he's like suffering from depression from this accident. And he sort of drinks himself, basically to death, to death. He doesn't die in office, but he, he dies shortly after leaving office because he just, he just like from depression, I guess, you understand? Um, but moving on here, we have the Kansas and Nebraska Act, 1854. Uh, and this became this very divisive law that started off, um, you know, with uh, the, the basic idea here was if we're going to build a railroad all the way out to California, it's going to have to pass through the Kansas and Nebraska territories. And so in order to do that, in order to build that railroad, we're going to have to make Kansas and Nebraska into states. Well, by the terms of the old Missouri Compromise, see that black line on this map, Kansas and Nebraska would be two new free states, no slaves. Um, Washington, people in Washington knew that would never happen. So, they came up with this Kansas and Nebraska Act. And the idea was to allow the people who live in those territories, Kansas and Nebraska, to vote on whether they wanted slavery or not. It's called popular sovereignty, right? You're deciding what you want for yourself. And it all sounds very democratic. It sounds really good. So this law ends up passing through Congress. Southerners are super excited about it because it now there's the possibility of slavery spreading to Kansas and Nebraska. All they got to do is get enough people to move there, enough like slave owners to move to Kansas, and they can vote in the election to allow slavery. Okay, so we're allowing the people of the Kansas and Nebraska to for themselves. But this leads to violence because you have pro-slavery and anti-slavery people moving to these two states, and they're living next door to each other, and they begin killing each other. In 1856, we get into, it's called Bleeding Kansas. There are a number of like battles between pro and anti-slavery forces. Dozens of people are killed in these engagements. Um, you had this guy, uh, John Brown. He was this incredibly like radical anti-slavery crusader. And he would go around like murdering slave owners, freeing their slaves. Like he'd, he'd like break into people's houses in the middle of the night and like murder the entire family and then free the slaves. So uh, I don't know if that's good or not. Put in the discussion. How does popular sovereignty help cause the civil war? Because it leads to the first examples of violence between pro and anti slavery forces. Um, here's another great example of, of the North and the South reacting differently to things. Sumner, Charles Sumner, Northern Senator, anti-slavery Senator, Congressman Preston Brooks, uh, pro-slavery uh, Southern Congressman from South Carolina. They had a, a little bit of disagreement, right? Charles Sumner had maybe sort of made fun of Preston Brooks's uncle, who was also another Senator. So Preston Brooks decides to um, 
you know, he's like, he's going to like uh, uh, save his family's honor. So he walks into the Senate chambers, finds Charles Sumner alone there working late one night, and he attacks him and he beats him nearly to death with his cane, right? He's like hitting him to the point where he's unconscious and he's just like pounding on him, on, uh, pounding on him um, to the point where he's hospitalized for like a year. He has like skull fractures and stuff. Southerners viewed this as an acceptable reaction. They viewed this as to a totally normal thing. Southerners actually sent Congressman Preston Brooks new canes to replace the one that he had broken. Uh, Charles Sumner, like I said, spent a year in the hospital recovering from skull fractures. Northerners viewed this as an example of the barbarism of the South. That the South was this barbaric culture with their slaves and it was just like violent, right? Uh, by the way, Brooksville, Florida is named after Congressman Preston Brooks. It's around this time that we get the creation of the Republican Party. And that is the Republican Party that still exists today. This is when it was created in 1854 by uh, sort of different elements of politicians who were all opposed to the Kansas and Nebraska Act. They did not want to see a situation where slavery would find a way to expand out west. But ultimately, the Republican Party is a Northern party, right? It is an anti-slavery Northern party made up of these groups here, Northern Whigs, Democrats, not super important. But you got to know that they were a Northern anti-slavery party formed in 1854 to oppose the Kansas and Nebraska Act. And they actually ran a guy in 1856, John C. Fremont. He's the first Republican candidate for president. He loses to James Buchanan. Uh, Buchanan, by the way, is uh, if when historians make lists of like who is the worst president ever, Buchanan tends to be pretty high on that list. Um, he's seen as just an ineffective sort of racist southerner uh, who could not unite the country at a time when it was tearing itself apart. He is also, interesting side note about James Buchanan, he was probably gay. Only president never to be married. Um, I feel bad for gay people, though, because if you're looking for like a role model and you're like, oh, like we got a president, we got a gay president, you can be a role model. But he was like the worst president ever. So you got to find a better role. Model. Sorry. Let's skip over this. Um, next up is a Supreme Court case, Dred Scott. Uh, you got this guy, Dred Scott. He is a slave. His, uh, his, I believe his master had lived in, in uh, Missouri. And then they had moved to the Minnesota Territory, which at the time was a free territory. And so when, when they moved there, Dred Scott sued for his freedom, saying, I live in a free territory, I should be free. So this case ends up getting to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court made the worst decision they've ever made. Here's what they decided. Dred Scott's still a slave. And they ruled that way because they argued that Dred Scott is not actually a person. He is the property of his owner and nothing more. He can never be a citizen. And because he's not actually like a person, that's why he can't even sue at all, right? Any more than like your couch could sue you for sitting on it. That's what the court decided. So that's horrific. Right? It also means that states in the North that have banned slavery the Supreme Court said that they can't do that because slaves are property and you can't take away someone's property without due process. So this was a very controversial decision. Uh, there was huge outrage. Of course, people in the South loved this decision. People in the North hated it. So another good example of the different reactions in the North and the South. We're gonna skip this and move to the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And we're getting into some familiar names here. Abraham Lincoln, and Stephen Douglas, okay? These are two politicians running for the Senate in the state of Illinois. They had a series of debates about slavery in 1858. Uh, and this is sort of where Abraham Lincoln first becomes a known person. Uh, he famously, during these debates, argued that a house divided against itself cannot stand, meaning that a country that is both uh, has free and slave states is never gonna last. We gotta do one or the other. And so that's the reputation that he had 
um, was that he was an anti-slavery guy. And look, the reality is, is, that, is that Lincoln's views on slavery were way more complicated. He was a product of his day. Um, but, you know, he ultimately, at first, like when he first is around, he's kind of like, you know, we can, we can kind of leave slavery where it is. Like, I'm not going to get rid of it or anything like that, but it's definitely a bad thing. Um, so that's what he's sort of known for, though, as being an, anti, an anti-slavery fan. Whether he really was anti-slavery at the start, not super important. Of course, his role in ending slavery during the Civil War would be very important. Eighteen fifty nine, we've got uh, a situation where that guy John Brown, remember the guy that was going around murdering people, freeing their slaves. He tries to begin a slave revolution. He attacks a military base in Virginia called Harper's Ferry in eighteen fifty nine. His plan was to capture this fort, steal all the guns, and give them out to slaves in the area to begin a revolution. Didn't work out that way. John Brown is shot. Uh, He doesn't die, but his five sons who were helping him, they all die in this attack. Northerners viewed John Brown as a martyr, a man who was willing to die fighting to end the evils of slavery. Southerners viewed him as a traitor. Arming slaves was the most dangerous thing you could do in the South. Uh, He survived his initial wound, but he was put on trial and he was found guilty of treason. He was executed. And the day he was executed, there were like, you know, funerals held all across the North to celebrate John Brown and how much of a hero he was and the whole thing. Like I said, Southerners viewed him as a traitor. Next year, 1860. Abraham Lincoln is back. He, he had lost the Illinois Senate election against Stephen A. Douglas, who's the guy here on the bottom of the screen. Lincoln, as the Republican candidate, runs in 1860, and he wins. And what is important to see here, when you look at the map, is that Lincoln won all of these purple states, right, which are the, all the free states. Lincoln's name did not appear on the ballot in most of these Southern states. So if you're a Southerner and you wake up after election day and you see that Abraham Lincoln has won, he's, the, he's gonna be the new president, but you didn't vote for him. No one you know voted for him because they couldn't, right? Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot. And what Southerners realize at this point is that they no longer have a say in who the president's going to be. And it, it's, it's, it's simply a matter of population. There were just way more people in the North. So these Northern states like Pennsylvania and New York are worth way more than say Texas and Louisiana at the time. So they realize that they're like sort of, they're out of it, right? The North can do whatever they want. And they've elected Abraham Lincoln as the president, a man that many people believe is anti-slavery. So in December of 1860, this is a, this is a, Lincoln would have won the election in November of 1860. He doesn't get sworn in until April the following year, like five months later. But in December, after the election, South Carolina decided, yeah, we're not going to stick around for this guy. We don't want to be part of a country that's elected an anti-slavery president because he's going to take our slaves. So in December, South Carolina is like, America, look, it's been great. We had a great time here, the whole Revolutionary War, wonderful, but we are out. We have decided we no longer want to be part of the Union. So they're the first state to leave, to announce that they're no longer part of America. A few days later, Mississippi on January 9th becomes the second state to go, and then Florida the following day. The rest of these blue states would leave over the next few weeks, seven of them. 
Now, eventually when the civil war starts and there's fighting that begins to take place, these purple states or pink states rather, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and half of Virginia leave the union as well. Uh, Virginia used to be this entire thing, but west, the western part of the state is gonna stay with the union. And this part will go with the South Confederacy as it will become known. Uh, the rest of these states, the sort of peach color states, uh, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, these are slave owning states, but they never leave the Union. They stay with the North throughout the entirety of the Civil War. So altogether, it's, it's, it's 11 states that leave the Union. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's debate, and we, you know, hopefully we're going to talk more about this as this week goes on debate about, you know, what ultimately the cause of the Civil War was or what the Confederacy stood for. Um, of course, you see it playing out today uh, in 2020. You know, you see issues of like the, the, the Confederate flag being flown and things like that. But if you ever want to know exactly what the South stood for, the, the purpose of the Confederacy, this is a speech given by Alexander Stevens, the man who became the vice president of the Confederacy of the South, those Southern states left the Union. And uh, you can read this, but it basically, you know, it basically says like, we're leaving and basing our country on the idea that white people are superior to black people. Okay, but that is the cornerstone, right? Like the main idea on which the, the Confederacy is based. So it's, 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 and you know, a lot of times you kind of got to read between the lines to figure out what a person is saying. Here we have in the words of the leader, you know, the vice president of the Confederacy, the Confederacy was founded on this idea that uh, black people are inferior to white people. So it's pretty clear here. Uh, finally, in April of 1861, by now Lincoln has been sworn in. But there is this issue in South Carolina at a, uh, a Union fort. This is a Union military fort with Union soldiers in it on an island called Fort Sumter, uh, just off the coast of South Carolina. And uh, the South wanted the fort. South Carolina wanted to take over this fort from the North. The Northern troops that were stationed there refused to leave. And so there was a bit of a standoff, eventually, the South uh, fires like cannons at the fort and the Union troops surrender. So no one actually dies at the battle of Fort Sumter, but this is the start of the Civil War. Once shots have been fired, you can't really take that back and the two sides are gonna begin fighting after this. So the Civil War is gonna last almost exactly four years from April 12, 1861 until April 1865. And it's going to be bad. More people are going to die fighting in the Civil War than all other American wars combined. So it's going to be pretty horrific. And we're going to get into that more uh, later this week or next week. But at this point, uh, now that you finished the video, you can head over to that discussion group and make your contributions, try and answer some of the questions that we saw here in the in the slideshow or the question about whether the Civil War was inevitable or not. Uh, make sure you reply to other people's comments as well. You can do that. Last slide here. This is just a quick, quick review of sort of the sequence of events and things that caused the Civil War. Slavery. It's the issue of slavery is the main thing. The breakdown of compromises uh, and the sort of immediate cause is the election of Abraham Lincoln. South Carolina leaves the Union, followed by the rest of the states, and the fighting begins at Fort Sumter. I'm going to stop sharing now. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Like I said, this is, we're going to do this about once a week, a recorded lecture. Um, so make sure you check these out every week. And uh, we're going to be using this information the rest of this week as well. So have a look at the PowerPoint file. Follow along if you had questions there. And make sure you go to that discussion group. You guys have a wonderful day. I hope to see you guys in person very soon.